want to welcome you today to the 1130 Wednesday Lunch and Bible Study from Birmingham, Alabama, Doctrinal Studies. Uh, we're currently in a study out of Genesis uh, 6, 7, 8, 9. We're going to do a special study on that subject dealing with the, the days of Noah are like the days of the Son of Man recorded in Matthew 24, 37 through 39 uh, taught by Jesus as it was in the days of Noah. Now, when you look at Genesis 6 uh, through 9, you see that we're in the last days of the days of Noah, which is kind of important to us uh, because as we study the days of Noah, we're going to learn how it's going to be um, compared to the days of the Son of Man. And that's the reason for my study. We live in the days of the Son of Man, the days of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's where we are in our study. And today we're going to look at chapter 6, 1 through, of, I don't know, 8, 5 or 8, something like that. I'm going to read through it. And the, the Nephilim race, the Nephilim, there were three races of the human race. There were three uh, races. There were the Canaanites, the Sethites, and the Nephilims. We'll talk about that today. But here it is. I'm in Genesis 6. Go get your Bible. <laughs> Go get your Bible. Open it up to Genesis 6. Get a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen. And let's do study. Later, you can go and pick this lesson up from our study uh, off our website, doctrinalstudies.com. But right now, it's Bible study time, so come on. Here's what it says. Now, it came about, we're talking about some events in the days of Noah that are important for us to understand uh, through the teachings of Jesus, as it was in the days of Noah, so, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. So it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the, of the land and daughters were born to them. Verse 2, that the sons of God, little s, and the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they took wives. Now you'll learn today as we study some of the Hebrew that the word for took is they took them forcibly. And they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. They just, when they found one, they just took her. Then the Lord said, now we've only had two verses, and the Lord said, my spirit, Holy Spirit, shall not strive with man forever. We did a study on that, how the Holy Spirit worked in the antediluvian civilization. We live in the post-diluvian civilization. They lived before Noah's flood. We live after Noah's flood. Uh, the Holy Spirit shall not strive. That's what he did with man in the antediluvian period. Because he also is flesh, nevertheless his days shall be 120 years. We would call that the last days of the days of Noah. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. Nephilim. In your, in your English Bible, that word ends in an I am that's a Hebrew word. Nephilim is a Hebrew word. And the I am in the Hebrew uh, is plural. And Nephilim comes from Naphal, N-A-P-H-A-L, and it refers to fallen ones. Fallen ones. That's what the interpretation of the word. These are fallen ones. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterwards, that is really important that you, you, we don't mean after the Noah's flood. He's, go, he's going to explain. This is going to occur in the days of Noah. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. And he explains, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bore children to them. What you're going to learn over the course of our study, when you look at Genesis 5, it gives the genealogy from Adam through Seth to Noah. 
and what it means about before and afterwards is dealing with the Nephilims marrying the, the uh, sons of God, marrying the daughters of men, and producing this third race called the Nephilims. This is going to occur. What is in reference here? It's going to occur according to the genealogy. It's going to occur. And I'm going to explain all this over the weeks to come. It's going to occur from the period of Japheth, which is the fifth generation from Adam, until, the, until Noah, which is the tenth. That's what all that refers to. The Nephilim went on earth in those days and also afterwards when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and, and they bore children to them, that is the Nephilim, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown in their, in their culture. And we'll explain all that. We'll explain all that. Not today, but over a course of time. But we're, we're just in Genesis 6, and we're going to 9. Then the Lord saw, notice in verse 3, the Lord said, verse 5, the Lord saw. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man, evil, culturally, it, that when it says wickedness, it refers to the saturation of evil. In the Hebrew word, they had ra, and it sometimes was translated wickedness and sometimes evil. It means the same thing in a different way. Evil has become saturated. It's called wickedness. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent, watch this now, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Evil, when it becomes the intent of man's heart, continuously, that's called wickedness. It's cultural evil. The culture of the antediluvian civilization has become corrupted. The Lord was sorry. The Lord said, the Lord saw, and the Lord is sorry. We'll talk about that later. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on earth and was grieved in his heart. The Lord said, second time, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animal to creeping things to bird of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Now, I can't possibly, over the course of time, I'm going to go in, I'm going to explain every bit of that. Today, I'm, I'm going to introduce you to the third race of the antediluvian civilization. We had the Cainites, you know, Cain and Abel, the, the ancestry of Cain, Seth, the Sethites, the ancestry of Seth, and then we have a third race introduced, the Nephilims. Now, it's going to take me a couple studies on the Nephilim for you to get all this, to get all of it. The purpose of the study over the course of some time, on the days of Noah, the antediluvian civilization, comes from Jesus' comparison to the days of the Son of Man. What we can learn about this is going to be prevalent and important to the time on which you and I live because we live in the last days. In today's lesson text, I just read Genesis 6, 1 through 8. In today's lesson text, God tells us that the primary cause of the divine judgment upon the antediluvian civilization was the saturation of evil exemplified in the third race, the Nephilim. That will be what is covered in Genesis 6 through 9. Then the Lord saw, watch two things, covered in the word that. Watch this now. I, I'm in Genesis 6, 5. Then the Lord saw first that the wickedness 
that's a cultural saturation of evil, of man was great on earth, and secondly, and that every thought of his heart was only evil continually. There was no room in his heart for God or anything God had to say. That's evil continuously in his heart. In Genesis 8, 21, taking a look forward, this evil, now called evil wickedness, it's become saturated culturally. This evil wickedness, this is Genesis 8, 21, this, this evil wickedness was taught to their children, to the children of the antediluvian civilization as truth very early in their lives. It become culturally acceptable. And it developed an entire culture of people saturated with evil thinking. What the devil tries to get you to do, and he did it successfully with these people, is to call evil good and good evil. And it takes a period of time. It took five generations to get where we are in the last days of the saturation of cultural evil. And Satan did it with the educational system. Huh? <laughs> Pay attention, dear hearts. Pay attention. Genesis 8.21 for the intent of man's heart is evil, evil from his youth. Genesis 8.21. This brings us to today's lesson in an introduction to the uh, Nephilim race. Genesis 6.4. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, fifth generation to the tenth. In those days and afterwards, fifth generation to the tenth. Fifth generation, sixth generation, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth, and boom, it's done. Is God not long-suffering and patient that none would perish? Second Peter 3, 9. Boy, he certainly is. In those days, days and afterwards, when the sons of God came into, and he explains these days, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children of them, these are called the Nephilim. These were the mighty men who were of old men of renown, and we'll talk about that in the days to come. The results of the sons of God marrying the daughters of men resulted in the Nephilim race. I'm going to try to explain that today to you. Today we're going to look at six aspects of the Nephilim race as we introduce it to you that brought the flood, a world flood, and destroyed the antediluvian civilization with the exception of eight people on the ark. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get into the morning, this morning's study. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. Do you get that? That's why we study the Bible. And boy, how important is the Word of God going to be in the last days of the Son of Man? Word of God. God said, God saw, God was sorry. I mean, you got to pay attention to that stuff. Well, to study the Bible in the church age under the new covenant, you have to be, you have, you have to be aware of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. He lives inside your body, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 and has made your body the temple of God, purchased with the blood of Christ from the cross. Now that Holy Spirit is there to be the dynamics of the Christian life in the church age. If there's personal sin in your life, it's because you've chose to go to the pleasure of sin in the flesh, the desires of the sin nature, and you've committed personal sin. What do you do with it? whether it be mental attitude, sin, sins of the tongue, or revert sins, what do you do with it when you are made aware by the Holy Spirit's conviction that that's sin, and the Bible tells you what sin is and what sin isn't? And when he calls your attention to it, what do you do? 1 John 1, 9 says, we confess our sins to God. 
He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us, which restores us to the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. Confession of sin is based on being cleansed by the blood of Christ, which deals with all sin, whether it be Adamic sin or personal sin. If it's Adamic sin, then the issue is justification. If it's confession of personal sin the issue in a believer's life, then the issue is sanctification, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. So let's do that. Be sure you make confession of your sin. If you're aware of any, confess it. If not, pray that God, God the Holy Spirit, teaches and recalls the Word of God, John 15, chapter. You should read John 14, 15, and 16 to see what the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, I'm going to promise you the Holy Spirit will do the following things, and he laid them out. Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way by the Internet. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God to our soul as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. And Satan was attacking was attacking the people of God and the Word of God. And he was doing it culturally. And he was doing it through marriages forcibly made. And why was he doing that? To corrupt the flesh, to destroy the messianic seed of Christ. Teach us that today, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Point number one out of six points. Jesus identified this evil wickedness as a normal everyday living in the last days of the antediluvian civilization, the 120 years. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 38 about describing as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were, he says, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. In other words, the evil, the saturation of evil culturally from the fifth, by the time they got to the tenth generation, taught within the school system. Evil taught within the school system, system bred culturally generation after generation of people who were not for God. Jesus taught that the, as a result of the evil wickedness, the antediluvian world became without understanding of divine truth and judgment. In Matthew 24, 39, Jesus said, and they did not understand until the flood came and took them away. And so will the coming of the Son of Man be. What evil does is Satan's strategy to blind the eyes of the unbelieving one. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. Here's a passage about this period of time. Peter talks about it in 2 Peter 2, 4 and 5. This will be a passage today that you'll want to be familiar with uh, for this study. Here I am, 2 Peter 2, 4, uh, let's, let me see where I want to begin. I'm going to begin in 4, I'm going to read 4 and 5. This was Peter's understanding of the days of Noah to the days of the Son of Man. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, you're going to find out that these are the sons of God who are, who are cohabiting with the daughters of men and producing a Nephilim race. This is going to be Peter's view. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment, you are going to be able to read that in Jude 6 and 1 Peter 3, 18 through 20. If you have a study Bible, they'll probably give you those references. If God did not spare the angels when they sinned, now he's going to identify them in the Bible. Verse 5, and did not spare the ancient world, that's the antediluvian world, 
the world before the flood, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, his, married, his three married sons with their daughters, with, with their wives, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Verse 4 and 5 is talking about where we are. We're in Genesis 6, 7, 8, 9. Peter makes this remark. Remember that it just didn't occur in, in the 100. To listen, when we get to the last days of the 120, it has already started with the generation of Jared, the fifth generation of Jared. I, I'm going to explain all this. I'm just giving you a foreground. I mean, you've never heard this before. I'm just giving you a heads up so that when I get here, you'll, you'll have some background for thinking. From Jared, the fifth, you can, read, you can read about this in Genesis 5, from the fifth generation to the tenth. Okay? I mean, go to Genesis 5 and start with about verse 17 and go to the end. Start with Jared and, and, and go through to Noah because that's what he's talking about. Point number two. It is important to understand the meaning of the Hebrew word Nephilim. Now, the word Nephilim in the Hebrew, I put brackets on your paper. It didn't realize that I wasn't going to be able to put them on the board for you. But Nephilim, in the Bible, it has the definite article, the, on the front of it. And Nephilim, the word Nephilim, N-E-P-H-L-I-L, comes from the verb naphal, N-A-P-H-A-L, and that means fallen one. This is plural, means fallen ones. And it doesn't refer to those in Adam. This is outside. This, this is not the fallen race in Adam. This is the fallen race outside of Adam that's done by evil, not sin. The verb navel, the verb, means fallen one. The suffix I am on Nephilim makes it plural and refers to fallen ones. And it's a divine viewpoint attack upon the messianic seed of Christ in the antediluvian period. Well, we're, we're going to look at all that. Point number three. It won't be today, but we're going to look at I'm going to introduce the ideas to you. Then we're going to break them down and look at them. This is called Bible study, and I'm going to give it to you. The Nephilim race was the fallen offsprings, not, not within the Adamic sin problem of Romans 5.12, wherefore by one man Adam sinned into the world. No, this is evil. It comes from the devil. Write the word devil on your paper. D, you know, write the word devil. Then mark through the word, mark through the letter D. What do you got? Evil. That's where it comes from. Just a simple way to remember where evil comes from. The Nephilim race was the fallen offsprings of the daughters of men marrying the sons of God as recorded in Genesis 6, 1 through 8. We learn from that that the antediluvian civilization consisted of three races, the Cainites, the Sethites, and the Nephilims. In Genesis 6, 12, God looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt. Now watch this. In what way was it corrupt? Well, saturation of evil. But watch this. That's the heart. He didn't say that in this place. He said that in 8th chapter 21. Notice what he said in 6.12. For all flesh has corrupted their way upon the earth. A corrupted flesh. A corrupted flesh. A corrupted flesh. Point number four. That's the Nephilims, a corrupted flesh. The third race, Nephilim, was genetic corrupted. It was a genetic corrupted flesh. 
I'm talking about DNA business. Of the mankind of the antediluvian civilization, a genetic corrupted, corrupted flesh, Genesis 6, 12. Satan show you the show you the strategy. Uh, Second Corinthians 2, 11 and 12, or somewhere in there, beware of the strategy of Satan. When Satan attacked Eve, and then later Adam through Eve, he attacked the word of God. He attacked the word of God. And what was it he after? God had given a command, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Genesis 2, 16, 17. And he began to attack that right away. He began to attack it. After the fall of Gen Genesis 3, 1 through 7, 8, God brought judgment upon the serpent, the woman, and the man. In Genesis 3, 15, he remarks about Satan, which Paul talks about in Romans 6, 20, 16, 20, that the serpent would bite, would bite, would, would bite his heel and and Christ, the seed of the woman, the seed of the woman, he would, Satan would bite his heel and he would crush Satan's head. A clear messianic prophecy. And so, this is after the fall of Adam. Now Satan's on the run again. Now what's he got to do? Listen, the seed of the woman is, is going to try to destroy me. So what's he do? Well, the first family has two children. They have Cain, and then they have Abel. Cain and Abel. Cain rises up and kills Abel, the messianic seed bearer. And who promoted that? Write this down, 1 John 3, 12. Satan did. What is he after? Once he had the prophecy of Genesis 3.15, he's out to destroy the seed of the woman. You know what's important about Genesis 6 in the angelic conflict? We're talking about the daughters of men. And one seed one woman group is to carry the messianic seed after Cain killed Abel the messianic seed he was expelled to roam the earth that's how we get the Cainite gen generation of people God Adam and Eve, God opened her wound again, and she had Seth. And we have the Sethites, the carrier of the Messianic seed through the woman, the Sethites. You're going to see that Satan understands this. And what he's going to do is he's going to attack both the Canaanite and the Sethites to be sure that the Messiah, that, that, he, that if he's misunderstood Genesis 3.15, he's going to nail the, both children that come from Adam and Eve. You, you getting that? Listen. When Jesus Christ was born, let me give it to you. When Jesus Christ was born, Bethlehem birth business, Herod became aware through the, through the Magi that the king of the Jews had been born. He checked with his theology group, and they went, yeah. So you know what he did? 
He created a black Christmas. Not a white one, a black one. Not a joyful one, a sad one. This is, this is Satan's strategy. To be sure, for Satan to be sure that the Messiah would not be missed. Matthew, the second chapter, he killed all of the children under two, two and under. Didn't, just didn't hunt for one and kill them, killed them all just to be sure he didn't miss them. Shows you how stupid he is, he missed them too. Satan's not smart. Don't give him any credit for being smart. He's deceitful and evil. But he's not smart. Listen, you as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ with the word of God, which is your sword in the angelic conflict, will slay him every time. He is afraid of you. Let me tell you who he was afraid of in the antediluvian period. It was Noah, the preacher of righteousness, blameless before God and walked with God no matter how the culture walked. Are you ready for that walk? Boy, you'd better be because we have been in about three generations of culturally teaching our children evil in our school system. Where have you been that you don't know that? I'll tell you what. Look at your kids after three generations. See where they are. Look at your, look at your children and your grandchildren and you'll know. My, my, my. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. And we're about as blind as they are. You know why we're blind? We don't study the Word of God. We don't have eyes to see the things of God. I don't know. I don't know who I'm talking to. Maybe myself. The third race, the Nephilim, was a genetic corrupted flesh. Satan is on the, always on the charge. Always on charge. He is always looking to stamp out the messianic seed with Jesus Christ. You know who the seed is today? It's not Jesus. He can't stamp him out anymore. He says at the right hand of God, authority over everything. You know, he tries to, you know what he tries to, now listen to me. You know who he's after today? The seeds of Christ, the sons of Christ, the sons of God. I mean the true sons of God, those who have been born again by the gospel of Jesus Christ, where we understood that he died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day to give me life everlasting. Huh? <laughs> Just telling you what it is. Just telling you the truth. Just telling you the truth. Now Satan is out attacking the genealogy seed of Christ. Recorded in Genesis 3.15. He's on the prowl again. He is on the prowl again. He's on the prowl again. The Nephilim were the only... Now, don't miss this. The Nephilim was the only Andaluvian civilizational race without a biblical genealogy. And I can't tell you how important that is. I know, I'm going to say it again because now, you know, you were a little disinterested when I talked about your grandkids. You don't pay any attention to them. Well, you should. Because they're not going to make the ark. When the, day, when the day comes, they're out in the toolies. And how do you know they are? Well, listen, if they're saved and they're in sin, they're going to be disciplined. You know, if, if you still have insurance on them, as a parent, you better do it or else you start saving up your money because 
You know, they're going to be disciplined. Hebrews 12. The Nephilims were the only race of the antediluvian period without a biblical gene genealogy, and the reason was their flesh was corrupted by evil, by Satan. We have the Canaanite generation in the fourth chapter, 16 through 21, recorded, the Canaanites. We have the Sethite gen genealogy recorded in Genesis 4, 25 through 32. But there is no record of the genealogy of the Nephilim. Nowhere. Corrupted flesh. Evil. That ought to tell you a whole lot. Point number five. This is a very important, I'm about to give you a very important doctrinal principle to biblical genealogies. And here are the principle. The male always carries the descendant's lineage. When you study the genealogy of the Canaanites and the Sethites, you will find this principle. Here it is. I'm just going to explain it to you. If a Canaanite woman marries a Canaanite man, a Canaanite man, the child is Canaanite. If a Sethite woman marries a Sethite male, the child is Sethite. Now listen to me. If a Canaanite woman, if a Canaanite woman, you know, of Cain's ancestry, marries a Sethite man, the child's a Sethite. If a Sethite woman marries a Canaanite man, the child is Canaanite. Let me give you a couple of examples. Matthew, let's go to Matthew. Oh, look, you got, we got, you got a minute, come on. Go to Matthew 1.5, where we have the genealogy of Christ given from Adam, given from Abraham through David to Christ. And I'm looking at verse 5 to show you an example. In verse 5, I have two examples. I have Rahab marries Salmon and has Boaz. I have Boaz, I have Boaz that marries Ruth and has Obed. Did you look that up? You go like, I don't like genealogy. You ought to like this one. Because what you have is Rahab, who was a Canaanite from the land of Canaan, was a Canaanite and married uh, Salome, who was a Judean Jew. They had Boaz, which was a, Jude a Judean Jew. Because it goes through the male lineage. Ruth, a Moabite woman, marries Boaz, Judean Jew, and has Obed, a Judean Jew. That's why they're into Matthew's genealogy. You understand the principle? It's a doctrinal principle of genealogy. Ah. <laughs> This is why this is an introduction, because this is, this is going to take some, some time to explain to you. Because evil is difficult to understand, especially when you're being brainwashed in a culture of it. We've been in it, listen, we've been in it for three generations, and the last two generations in my lifetime, the last two generations, they've repped, they... And, and it's gone wild. It's to, today, it's wilder than ever. My, 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 do you not understand this? It, it has gotten out of what we would say control. They're no longer hiding behind the walls of the school. They're out pushing it. Oh, my, 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 my. 
Point number six, and then I'm going to close. The sons, of man, the sons of God married the daughters of the Sethites and the Canaanites. See, that's the way Satan operates. He has to get them collectively. He has to get them because he don't know which ways to go on because he's dumb as a brick. He's dumb as a brick. That's why evil is stupid. And what they produced, the sons of God, they married the Sethites, and they married the Canaanites, and they both produced Nephilims. Because, it, they, listen, it goes through the male, the son. And what did they produce? What did these sons of God produce? Out of their genetics... What did they produce? Fallen ones, not under Adam. This has nothing to do with Adam's sin. This has to do with evil corruption of the flesh, the, the genetics of a flesh, of an entire race of people who, who now have attacked both of the other, the Canaanites and the Sethites, both from Adam and Eve. This is Satan's strategy, straight up and straight down, to be sure he doesn't miss it. Nephilim, so the, the, their name Nephilim means fallen ones from the fallen one and the fallen one, 2 Peter 2, 4, and 5 says we're angels, fallen ones, angels, fallen angel. I want to talk about it next time. Where did the idea of Nephilim come well, it came from the sons of God because of the male. And it was, it, it genetically corrupted the other two races so that there was only one pure group And that was from the Noah's family of the last days. His three sons married three women, Sethites. So that we have eight people on the ark that come out of the antediluvian world. A special Hebrew term, a special Hebrew word or term was given to describe the copulation between the sons of God, fallen angels, as you will find out, and the daughters of men, both Canaanites women and Sethite women, it's found in Genesis 6-4, and it's the word came. Now, when Adam and Eve had sexual relations, copulation, to produce a child, in Genesis 4-1, it was the word yada. He knew his wife. Adam knew his wife, and she bore him a child. Yada. This is not the word that's used with the Nephilim. It's the word bo, B-O. It's a callum perfect, and it's described in the English as came rather than yada. This was Satan's attack upon the seed of Christ through the daughters of men to destroy Genesis, the third chapter 15. In Genesis, when it says that the sons of God took, in verse 2, the sons of God saw the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives. Took wives. Yalak is the word. It's a cal imperfect, and it means forcibly. They took them forcibly. This same idea and word is used in Genesis 34.
when a daughter, the daughter of Jacob and Leah, when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hephite, the prince of the land, saw her, he took her and, and sexually forced her and lay with her by force. He sexually assaulted her. That's the word that's used in Genesis in our passage. And boy, did that turn out. When, that, when her brothers Simeon and Levi, when they found out, they took matters in their own hands. Well, that's as much as I can get today. Thank you for coming. I hope we have uh, stirred up some interest in this subject, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be. How, what would be our comparison? Not the Nephilim's, the saturation of evil and Satan's attack. Who does he attack today? The seed of Christ, the church. The sons of God in Christ. He's out to destroy the church. He started right out in, the, in Acts Right out in the book of Acts, by the time we get to chapter 7, I mean, he's got them all stirred up, and they kill Stephen, lay their coat at the foot of Saul of Tarsus, who picks the mantle up and tries to destroy the church. Listen, the war still goes on because the church has the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is what the church, under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, It's what stops the growth of evil in a nation. We're, we're, you can study that in the Second Thessalonians. And, you know, I just say, well, where's the church? Where's the church? We're the people of the church. Where are you and your family? I mean, how are we going to reach our grandkids who have come up culturally under evil thinking for two or three cultures and we, we wake up and our, our kids are, are saturated with evil thinking and, and it's difficult to get them out of it. It's not impossible, but it's difficult. So what do we do? We, listen, we, we pray for them and, we, and, we, and we, we, we try to combat that in their life with the word of God. And you go after the culture that's in school. You got to go after young people today both in the grammar schools, right down to kindergarten now, they're doing it. You got to get them all the way. Young families. Father, we're thankful today for your word. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. The last days of Noah... Here we are in the last days of the Son of Man, and here we are facing the same deal, the corruption of a culture by evil. Church needs to be bold. They need to be in, in, in very evangelical, and they need to, if they need to set up schools to teach their children the truth of the Word of God, they need to have church schools. Don't matter whether or not the government won't finance them. Who cares? God will. 
But listen, if the church is not going to teach the children the truth of the Word of God, if you're going to teach them evil, you might as well shut it down and shut up. Somewhere, somebody has got to listen to the voice of God. And we've got to do something about this. America's in deep trouble. And if you know that, then you know what I'm talking about. And over the next course of time, we will study together how to arm ourselves. Because, listen, greater is he who is in you, the Holy Spirit, than he who is in the world, the devil. 1 John 4, 4. We thank you today, Father, for all that you've teach us and the freedom we have to still preach from the pulpit. How long they will allow us on the Internet with this kind of discussion, who knows? Because we live in a culture that is saturated with evil. And it's getting worse every day. In Jesus' name, amen.